Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We're really excited to be here with all of you tonight to celebrate Weightless, Making Space for My Resilient Body and Soul. It's a brand new book by Yvette Dion, and she's here in conversation with her friend, Erica Buddington. Um, and this book is a poignant and ruthlessly honest journey through cultural expectations of size, race, and gender, and towards a brighter future. So I'm going to introduce first our, our woman of the hour. Yvette Dion is a journalist, editor, and cultural critic. She is the former editor-in-chief of Bitch Media, much love publication uh, around, around Karis and in the feminist world, and the current executive editor of Yes Media. Lifting as we climb, Black women's battle for the ballot box was Dion's middle grade nonfiction book about Black women suffragists, and it was nominated for a National Book Award. It won a Coretta Scott King author honor. She now lives in Denver with her partner and her two pets, and they are likely listening to Beyonce right now. <laughs> um, she's joined today by Erica Bunnington, who is a culture curator who designs culturally relevant curriculum, writes and performs work that reflects the diaspora and defies and decolonizes the status quo. Buddington is the CEO of Langston League, a culturally responsive curriculum design firm that partners with clients like Movers and Shakers NYC, Google Code Next, Harlem Children's Zone, Achievement First Schools, Medgar Evers College, Pratt Institute, and more. Langston League is responsible for the unofficial Black History Lovecraft country syllabi, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, so glad to know that that was your creation. It went viral during uh, the television show. And Erica has spent the last decade honing her crafts. 2017 WeWork Creator Award winner, Harlem Children's Zone Innovation Award winner, 4.0 Schools Essentials Fellowship recipient, and Hampton University's 2019 Notable Hamptonian in Hip Hop. Using her unconventional methods, sustainable responsive strategies, and her vast knowledge of pop culture, she creates engaging human learning experiences like no other in and out of academic spaces. She also hosts a YouTube show for kids entitled Decolonize and writes for NBC's The Amber Ruffin Show. So we are in great, great, great company tonight. And I'm going to unmute y'all and encourage everyone to feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, but for now, I just want to say welcome. Thank you both so much for celebrating this book at Thank you, E.R. Oh, hey, hey. Um, listen, I'm honored, honored to be here with my journalist, editor, National Book Award nominee, Coretta Scott King Award. You know I'm about to hype you up. Award, <laughs> culture aficionado, and really my friend, um, Yvette Dion. Listen, I... Anyone who was tuned in right now was just about to get um, one of our phone calls. <laughs> That's literally what they're about to do. Yeah, yeah. Because I have so much to say about Weightless. And I don't know if you can see behind me, but I, I got a few copies. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, I remember us talking about the title for this book event. And it is the perfect name. Because as I was reading this, something was lifting off of my soul because there were so many experiences in this book and we've had tons of conversations and I feel like we have still have so much to talk about that I was like, if this is a mirror, as a plus size black woman who has internalized fat phobia, who has experienced these things out of the mouths of friends and family, who has watched pop culture yearning to see my reflection, I'm literally reading this book and going, oh my God, I thought it was just me. And so you literally are lifting a weight that I've felt for a long time. And this was the perfect name for the book. And so the first question I have to ask is, what was it like putting those personal experiences on paper like this? Like, I know that this is a very difficult process. And, I, you know, I have to know, like, was there a pilgrimage where you have to tussle with those memories? You know, I really would love to know, like, what was the experience like writing this book first from a craft perspective? Because there are stories here that so many people are going to be grateful that you're telling them. Yeah. yeah. You know, vulnerability is 
hard. It's not hard. Like you and I are like real deal friends. So we talk all the time. It's not hard to have vulnerable conversations among friends. It's hard right. to take those vulnerable conversations and say, I'm going to give them to the world and I'm leaving them up to audience interpretation. And I hope that it lands in the spirit in which it's given. Like that's really difficult to do. But from a craft perspective, I knew that what I really wanted to do was like use a chorus of voices to, to guide people toward uh, a better understanding of how fat phobia shows up in our world and how it's compounded by race and class and gender and all the oppressions we think about. And also I knew that to get people there, I had to use my own story. Like I knew my story would pull people in. Like it was the gateway to get people invested and interested. But I, I was only able to do it because I was in therapy. If I was not in therapy as I was writing this book, there's no way I would have gotten even halfway through it, let alone over the finish line, like re, without re-traumatizing myself, without feeling like, I, can, I can't, be, and then I've been working on the book for so long and then having to come out and talk about the book and, and revisit these moments. I read the audio book. I would not have been able to do that and really like separate myself emotionally from the stories that are told in this book if I were not in therapy when I was writing it. Wow. You know, I, therapy, I feel like it's something that is just in the recent years becoming something that we talk about as a community over and over again. And so, you know, in reading the beginning of your book, I was like pleasantly surprised to see how immersed and involved your parents were in your mental health experience, right? Um, and suffering from anxiety and depression, um, and forgive me if I pronounce this wrong, agoraphobia, right? I, I feel that I very much had some of those tendencies coming up. And it's not to say that my parents weren't aware, but I would say that our community is less immersed in, you know, seeing those things, seeing the symptoms and going, wait a minute, this is something that needs to be addressed. Is that something that you've had conversations with your parents about where they, like how they were able to discern something is wrong, like we need to get that to the right folks. Um, what is their background with mental health look like? That was the first thing that ran through my mind as I as I read the ways in which your parents interacted with you. So I would love to know. Yeah. Um, both of my parents have a history with mental health, like individually, and then we have a familial history. So it wasn't until I was older, maybe in the last five years, that my dad shared with me that when my grandmother was carrying him, she had a nervous breakdown. And that my my grandfather at a point, and what they call nervous breakdown now is like anxiety, depression, like you're so overwhelmed, you can't move forward. Um, my mother has a, a long history with her own mental health and her own mental health journey. And so I think and my brother also has a, a mental, uh, also has a mental illnesses, like compounded mental illnesses. And so I think my parents were able to spot it because they had it. And they understood like there was a punitive aspect of that. If it were just like I was at home struggling, but I was still able to function on an everyday basis, it would be a different situation. But because agoraphobia is like extreme form of social isolation, like I would try to leave the house and have panic attacks. I, there was a punitive measure of that. Like I couldn't go to school, so I became a truant, which means we had to go to court and my parents were facing jail time. They were almost forced to first learn the ins and outs of the illness and then become advocates to keep us out of jail, to be honest, to keep us out of jail and allow us to remain as the family that we were so I wouldn't be removed from the home. That's the reason why that happened, but I think it helped that they all they also had their own mental health journeys that they were navigating. Absolutely, absolutely. It's I, I feel I feel like for me, right, like understanding, you know, like seeing the symptoms is really what's going to guide you to where you need to be. I feel um, as I speak to my friends and kind of I'm noticing things that I've worked through in therapy and I like notice it in friends. I point it out now because I know that like if you don't have the context and the experience, it's not something that you're going to be able to identify within yourself. So I'll go, hey. Have you had a chance? And so I really believe that like that those first few chapters are going to do that for folks as they read and go, wait a minute, like this is something that I experienced as a young person or I'm experiencing now, right? And I need to go and be proactive about it. Um, speaking about proactive, right? I There was this meme that went around on social media for a while and it was like, if you are a woman or anyone, honestly, who feels like your doctor is not listening to you, right? And mm -hmm. you for a specific request, make them put it in the chart. Do you remember that? They're like, make them put it in your chart. And yep. I was like, wait a minute, this is a thing? Like, I, I didn't know that I could do that. 
And I remember it being the first time that I advocated for myself and said, like, yo, um, okay, you say you don't want to run this test, put it in the chart. And then the doctor was like, hold up, wait a minute. They were like, I don't mind running this. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, 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 now you want to run this. <laughs> And so, you know, reading about the way in which you advocate for yourself um, as you're experiencing, like th that chapter, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, I cried. Like, even though as your friend, it's something that we talked about, like hearing it from you, maneuvering from doctor to doctor, and like, honestly, you just gave them, <laughs> you were too nice. Because there were certain moments where you were put in parentheses, like, and of course I found another doctor. I'd be like, no, let's pause. Let's talk about what, like, you know, I was really incensed when reading that section. Um, and, I, you know, I know that there are people that are going to read and say, like, you know, even though you did share some of it with us, what does that proactiveness look like, right? Is it just putting in the chart or is it, you know, um, I'd love to hear more about those boundaries you talk about. Um, you know, you highlighted certain experts that say sometimes you might have to call ahead and say, hey. Here are things that, you know, you can't do while I'm at an appointment. And so I'd love to hear more about some of the boundaries you set while advocating for your health care. Yeah. So, uh, so we, we're taught when we have a doctor, like doctors are these all-knowing gods, right? Like they know far more than, than you do and you never ask questions. If they tell you this is what it is, this is what it is, and you do what it is, they tell you. So we're also trained in that way because our healthcare system is so messed up that when you get a doctor, a semi-decent doctor, you stay with that doctor no matter what, even if the doctor is not serving you. Like I have members in my family who've been seeing the same doctor, like my grandmother saw that doctor, my uncles and aunts see that, like they've been with the same doctor. And even if that doctor is not serving them, like you build up this level of comfort with that doctor, so you just stick by them no matter what. I'm of the mindset that you go through doctors until you figure out the one that's for you. And having a, a very clear idea in your mind about what it is that you need. Do you need a health at every size doctor who's gonna treat your illnesses and not treat what they consider obesity as an illness? If that's what you need, you gotta find a doctor who does that. Do you need a doctor who provides space for you to ask questions and doesn't um, become offended because you're asking questions about a treatment plan or a medication they're putting you on or a diagnosis? If that's what you're what you're looking for, that that's what you have to go out and find. And if you're in a situation where that's not possible, that's where the boundaries come in. Of I'm very clear when I go to the doctor, don't weigh me. There's no unless I'm unless you're having anesthesia or there's some surgical procedure that could be affected by the size of your body. There's really no legitimate reason why doctors weigh you, like none. It's just what? a normal part of the process. You just think, oh, I just go when I get weighed. That does not have to happen. I, I am a, a firm believer in calling ahead and saying, hey, if I'm going to see a doctor for the first time, I'm a plus size person, I'm a fat person. When I come to see this doctor, I don't want to talk about weight. That, what, what is this doctor's history when it comes to treating obesity as an illness? Those are the sorts of boundaries you can set in place. So you and the doctor come in on like a clear playground, basically. Like you're on a, a clear playing field. You're both in agreement about what is going to happen. And then you can really test that doctor out and figure out, like, is this the right person for you or not? And if they're not, ditch them. Honestly, don't stick with somebody who's not serving you. Ooh. I just, you know, hearing you say that, you know, there was this line that really got to me. It was like, um, there was a study where folks were even saying that they don't go to cancer screening because they're so anxious about the way in which they're going to be treated by their primary care physician or whatever, whoever, whatever, whoever the physician is in front of them. But they're just yeah. like, you know, what? I know that there are these screenings that I need to have, but I'm going to skip it because I'm so anxiety filled. And I'll be honest, that's me sometimes, right? Like I know that my primary care physician is going to chastise me about my weight. And so there, I'm, I should be seeing him every six months. And sometimes I'll make it a whole year because I am anxious about that. And so, you know, I know that in, in seeing that study, as well as multiple other things you mentioned in that particular essay, um, what would you say is an example, because like, I know you, you probably did a lot of research and you've done research throughout the years, an example that you most saw your, yourself reflected in, like what study or piece of quantitative information made you go, wow, you know, I'm not a... The, the first thing that made me start thinking about this is like, Oh, my, my experience is not an anomaly. I, on Twitter, of course, saw this woman who was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And she was a fat woman. 
And her doctor kept telling, no, she had stage three. And her doctor kept telling her like, oh, you'll be fine. If you lose weight, you'll be fine. And by the time they caught the cancer, it spread to stage three. It progressed to stage three. And that's when I started thinking like, that there has to be something underlying this. It can't just be that like all of, if, if you have multiple isolated incidents, they add up to a pattern to me. Like it's not just things that exist in silo on islands. There, there's something about, there's sy something systemic going on within the medical field that this keeps happening. Mm -hmm. I was thinking a lot when I was um, putting that, that chapter together and started thinking about that chapter. I thought a lot about Serena Williams. And about that experience of giving birth, having a history of blood clots, saying to her nurse, I have had, I have a history of blood clots. I am in fear that I'm developing a blood clot and the nurse dismissing her and her having to push like, no, something is wrong. It's Serena Williams. We're talking about the greatest tennis player ever, possibly the greatest athlete ever saying there's something wrong and they don't believe her. She has power, she has wealth, she has an ability to get the best care in the world and doctors and nurses don't believe her. There's something wrong with the way the field is set up. And that's what I wanted to explore in that chapter is it's not, my experience is not some isolated experience that just happened to me. This is happening at various levels on a wide spectrum across the country because this is the way doctors are trained. Absolutely, yeah. I, you know, you mentioned Serena in your, um, the mother's essay, right? And, you know, when we think about being mothers, there's so many things that come across our minds. And I just, one of the things that you said that I resonated with as well was, you know, I, it, at one point in my life, it did not matter to me whether or not I was going to have children, right? Until I was told definitively, no. And then it was like, wait a minute, right? Um, and so to have that choice removed, right, I'd love to talk about, like, your evolution since having, like, first thinking, like, oh, it doesn't matter to being told no to the type of mother that you aspire to be now based off all of these experiences um, that you've discerned through Serena or, like, in your conversations about your own health and how essentially having a baby could destroy your body, right? I think... I'm sure it has shaped your perspective on the mother that you aspire to be. And so I'd love to hear about that, that evolution. Yeah, um, yeah I was with you. I, 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 at a point, could care less. Like, if I became a mom, great. If I didn't become a mom, great. It wasn't something that really dictated how I wanted to move forward in my life. Like, I was very career-focused, career-driven for a very long time. And whether or not my life expanded in other ways, didn't matter all that much to me. It wasn't like it didn't matter at all, but it wasn't a top priority for me whether or not I decided to have children. And then when I, um, heart, people with heart failure have babies all the time, mm. all the time. It's not necessarily recommended, but it's not forbidden. Pulmonary hypertension, it's a contraindicated condition. Pregnancy is contraindicated. Having children is a no-go. It just is. And, and the reason for that is, they, they have, like, they can get you from beginning of pregnancy to having the baby, right? Which is how our healthcare system works. Like, they care about a parent as long as they're gestational, as long as they're carrying a fetus. That's how long they care about the parent. And then what happens is after the child is born, they usually are born via C-section, as the body tries to, to return to some semblance of normalcy, the heart stops because you have so much fluid in your body and there's so much going on in your body. Typically, um, it's like the number is like 63% of people with pulmonary hypertension who have babies die. Wow. And that's the reason why. So on the, on the, other, they haven't figured out how to save people after the child is born. When the body is trying to return to normal, they haven't progressed that far in medicine to figure it out. So when I heard that, I still didn't feel like this need like to, to give myself the, the option. And then I started taking a medication to treat pulmonary hypertension and you can't even consider becoming pregnant on that medication because it causes such severe birth defects. So it, it forced me to make a decision overnight. Like I was on the fence and it was like, well, if I'm gonna, if I'm going to eventually decide that I wanna have children, I need to make that decision right now. And I called a reproductive endocrinologist and went through the process of freezing my eggs. And now I'm at a place where like, I can't carry the child 
but I want to be a mom. And mm. I want to be the kind of mom who encourages my children to be, to develop positive self-image. I really think positive self-image, protecting them from fat phobia, instilling them with, imbuing them with confidence can help them ward off so much. It's one of the things like when I was a child, as much as my parents loved me and as sheltered as I was, the, the confidence wasn't there and it derailed me for a long time. I wanna instill that up front and, and have children who respect their bodies as they are in every iteration, like believe their body, no matter what's happening with their body, like it's good enough as it is. And really, I can't, I can't control what happens outside of my home, but in my home, like really steal them and prepare them for a world that really wishes they didn't exist, to be honest. That's real. No, that's real. Um, I love that description. It, it, you're definitely going to be a possibility model for many. And speaking of possibility models, you introduced that term by um, Laverne Cox and Janet Mock in the book. And you talk about possibility models um, that you experienced growing up. And first of all, I did not know that you watched Drop That Diva. <laughs> like, oh, Drop That Diva. <laughs> I was like, this is such a good show. Like, I did not know anyone else watched Drop That Diva. Um, and it had the best love life. I was like, okay, come on, you know. And so, yeah, I just, I would love to talk to me, for you to talk to me about some of the possibility models you mentioned in the book, like Khadijah James. Um, and you know, America Ferrera on Ugly Betty, et cetera, and why you felt like they and them in particular um, were important to incorporate. Um, I, don't, I didn't get to this level. I was, I was very intentional in the book about honoring the people who helped me form a self image. And a lot of that happened for me in pop culture because I, though I'm very fortunate to have grown up in a family, like my mother is a plus size woman, my grandmother is a plus size woman, my best friend is, a, I, I'm just, I'm fortunate, right? Like everyone right. in my life for the most part um, has some of the same struggles I do. So I never felt like the one and the only. Mm. At the same time, when I was trying to form self image, I had to look outward of like seeing how other people even if they were just characters on television, were able to navigate the world. And so for me, like a possibility model, like a role model is like, we, we project so much on role models. They have to be perfect. They have to be like, they gotta raise our kids. And I'm, I'm not of that ilk, but a possibility model just shows you how it could be. Like they model for you what your life could look like. And that's what these characters did for me. Like Khadijah James, like I am a magazine editor because I watched Khadijah James on Living Single and I wanted to be her. I didn't think she was raising me. She wasn't like, I wanted to be her. I wanted to live in a brownstone in Brooklyn with my three friends and I wanted to run my own magazine and she got to date all the fine men. <laughs> so like all the fine men um, were in, were, in her realm and she got to just exist and i feel the same way about drop dead diva like different scenario like she's a lawyer different scenario but mm -hmm. she is so self-determined mm. that there, nobody can come in her orbit to try to discredit her or make her feel bad about herself like she just literally doesn't allow it all of those characters did that for me and helped me form a self-image that's very much in that same vein wow you know, um, you just listed a bunch of stuff that I don't think you give yourself enough credit. First of all, you lived in a brownstone apartment. <laughs> I did. Yeah. You ran plenty of magazine. <laughs> at a tour yeah. Right? Sure. You, you dated hella fine men. <laughs> okay? So I'm just going to say, like, you know, and, like, the other day, somebody pointed out to me that Khadijah James was doing editorial from home. Like, you know, like, yes, yeah, she had the office, but there was a season where, like, you saw Khadijah sitting at the desk, like, in the living room working actively. And I'm like, this event right here, like, so <laughs> you can say what you want, right? Like, you wanted to, you did, you done. I just want to put that up there. You did. I'll you did. Myself. I did it. That's right. <laughs> um, you know, and speaking of did and done, I just, 
um, reading about your experience in New York, because I think that that's where we spent a lot of time together, right? Um, and especially just the way in which the aggression behind folks harassing you on the street. I was like, what? Yeah. Like, we didn't have to say, like, go, I had no idea, right? Um, and you know, that's very much been my experience in this city, too, right? Um, and, and also, you kind of touched on it, like, when you're in the beauty supply store in a different essay, you're in a beauty supply store and you're with your mom and your mom's friend and this guy comes in and you know he's like oh trying to talk to you and so yeah that harassment right mm -hmm. there's a shift that happens right where we go from the space of doing the online catfish with shop we're gonna talk about that in a second right like going in a space of like being in a live journal and being whoever you want to be to actually like being out in the world and suddenly folks are seeing you but for all not not i don't want to say they're wrong reasons but their reasons are wrong, right? Yep. And so, you know, I just, I know, and I know that, like, some some young girl is going to replay this. And I, I would love to hear, like, what are the words you have for her when it comes to understanding that, like, her worth is more than that, right? Like, yeah. What a question. Um, when, when, you're, when you're a fat girl... Every morsel of the is supposed to be something considered good. Doesn't matter because we're we're taught that like on a totem pole of desirability and attractiveness, like we're at the bottom of the totem pole, or very low to the bottom. So anybody who plays you any attention is worth it, worth your time, worth your effort, worth you know pursuing relationship with, even if they don't treat you well. And so like that that was my experience for a long time and. What I say, what I say to young girls is, you're entitled to figure out what it is that you want for yourself. What do you want? And waiting for the person who's willing to do that, willing to show up for you in the way that you desire, willing to be with you in the way that you desire. And any person who approaches you on the street in the way that I was being approached, that I that I highlight in the book, is not worth your time. Absolutely. <laughs> Because if you if you then say no, I'm not interested, and they turn around and insult you, they're not worth your time. They're not worth you turning around. They're not worth you saying hello. You don't have to smile for them. Like you're entitled to exist in your body, and it's not public spectacle. Absolutely. Woo. That's a word. That's a word. Matching. Come on, come on, sure. I just realized. Okay. Come on, green. <laughs> Green was just on my brain today. I don't know why. I was like, I woke up and I was like, I'm wearing green today. Like, that's crazy. That's God. Um, so, I, yo, there's this. There, okay. So, as a plus size woman, um, or woman, you know, who men are often intimidated by, right? I know you can. That experience resonates with you as well. Um, there's a word. I think we all have a word that we can't like we use to kind of describe the way in which certain men perceive us and that word for me was is unicorn right and it's like i always felt like i was this thing to be placed back on the shelf like this thing that was too fragile or too unique to walk through life with and that word for you in your book seems to be prototype yeah right and you know talk to me about the sentiment of being someone's prototype and how you freed or are freeing yourself from that because i know that it's still something that i'm undoing and I would love to hear like how you went going through the process of freeing yourself, what that was like. Yeah. The way I describe the prototype in the book, I think about it, I I, I frame it as like the prototype of like the refrigerator on the on the factory floor. So it's not the final version, but it's the version that you test out, experiment with, see if it works or not, make tweaks to, and then you create a final. That's the way that I felt as a human for a long time. That the, right. the romantic partners I was encountering on the surface said, like, you are everything I could ever want. Like, you're really smart and you're really pretty. You're really smart. <laughs> you're really pretty. And you have this ambition and you're so confident and, and you're so caring. You're so loving. But when it came to the, the push comes to shove of that, I'm not exactly what it is that they wanted. And, that, and that's not just... 
um, because of just something they did. Sometimes I wasn't setting boundaries. I wasn't communicating well. I wasn't being honest about what it is that I wanted. So it was like a mutual, um, a, a mutual miscommunication in some instances. But I felt as if I was always like the doll put back on the shelf in the way that you described it. Like always like, you're too fragile, you're too perfect. I, I can't fit into your world. I can't live up to you. I can't compete with you. So I can't be with you. And what I found, especially now being in the relationship that I'm in, is that it, it never had to be that way. It never had to be that way. That is socialization and the way we think about desirability and, and the ways in which men think about masculinity all tied up into, I can't be with you because you might outshine me. And that was a hard one to be in. I felt for a long time I would never find a partner who was okay with me being who I am and could walk alongside me and not feel intimidated or afraid or, or as if um, they're not good enough to be with me. And so the unlearning for me looks like being okay with being taken care of. That's what it looks like for me. Like being okay with not having to be the person in control, not having to be the person deciding everything, like being willing to be in true partnership. That's what my unlearning process looks like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, speaking of partnership, you know that we spent to talk about my favorite subject, which is uh, dating. What? <laughs> Well, okay, wait, hold on, we got, no, actually, I was going to say dating, you know, but like, I, right, but absolutely, absolutely, the catfish experience had me blown away because I think every girl can that like lived on the internet during the time of AIM chat rooms and Zanga and Live Journal and all the, all the things, right? We can all say that we have at least cyber dated one guy who had like the perfect sob story or like the perfect story of like, oh, I live here and I'm that dude and everybody loves me or whatever, but would never actually show up, right? Um, and it's just, I, you know, there is such a lens placed on, and it, it's because of the show catfish, right? Placed on women of color, plus size women of color in catfish. And, like, there's a stereotype that, like, we, they are the only ones who do that. When it's actually just a, it's something that I feel folks who are dealing with, like, this outcasting, this, you know, oppression outside are doing because they just want to feel loved. Because they just want to, you know, not be alone, right? And so I love the fact that in that essay, while you are critical of the way in which this gentleman approached you, right? You are also empathetic in the sense that you understand why someone would do that. And so I, I just love to hear more about that empathy piece because I think that that's something that we don't talk about enough. Like people catfish because they want to be loved, right? So yeah. What made you want to write that essay? Like why did you think that was something that should have been incorporated in the wait list? Um. I, well, originally, I thought it could be an extension of the experience of agoraphobia and the lengths that we are all willing to go to form connection with people. Uh, it wasn't just like the, the way we're thinking about catfishing right, in our, and, and the way that it's become like a part of our lexicon in the last 10, 12 years. It, it's about physical appearance. It's about saying, posting photos, sending photos, impersonating someone else online because you're uncomfortable with your physical appearance. And that that is a form of catfishing. But there was the form that I was participating in, too, where like when we grew up, there were no camera phones. There was no. So I didn't have to lie about how I looked because nobody knew. But right. I invented this whole world that I wasn't actually living in because I was agoraphobic and I was stuck in the house. So I invented this whole world, which is also a form of catfishing, of like there were people in my life and I had all these friends and all these things that were going on that weren't true because I also yeah. wanted to have connection. I also desired connection. And so I'm, while I was upset, when I finally figured out um, that the person was catfishing me, which is only because I had watched the show and I was like, oh, all 
Yep, yeah, that check. Yep, that that tracks. That tracks. That tracks. Once I figured that out, of course there was anger there, but I also had empathy because I was doing it too, and I came to understand like having watched the show, and I still watch the show. Like they have marathons on MTV every morning. <laughs> watching it every day. I didn't know that. Um, I, thought the I did not know that. They okay. Do. Every morning, like every till like early afternoon, they run a, a catfish marathon. Um, like having watched the show for 10 years and studied the show and, and kind of examined the ins and outs of it. All of these folks want connection, whether or not they want to admit that some are more defensive than others. Some are sadder than others, but they go to this extreme length because they just want to feel loved. Right. By someone who loves them. Right. I mean, speaking of acceptance and like wanting someone to love you, you also talk about this like, and this was a, an essay that comes later on, which is about falling into like the monotony of a relationship that you know is a comfortable one, one that you probably shouldn't be in because there are warning signs there. But because you are perhaps concerned that there might not be more out there in the world beyond this, right? You fall into this, I don't want to argue, I'm going to tiptoe around, you know what I mean? Um, and I just, I, 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 I ain't going to lie, I saw versions of me in that essay, you know, in dating, and I was in the past, I'm just like, wow, I didn't know anyone else was doing this, doing this tiptoe of, and, and this dance with comfortability um knowing that this is not right for you and so i know so many people are in relationships like that and do not understand and that it is because of what we've internalized about ourselves which that's why we stay in those relationships what do you have to say to the people who are still in those relationships Ooh. okay so about relationships particularly if we're if we're learning from previous generations is as long as someone is not abusing you, cheating on you, having outside children, you stay. And if everything lines up except for this 10%, stay. Right. What I tell people is it's okay to say this relationship no longer serves me. Because that, that's mostly what relationships are about. We don't own one another. I, I don't own the person I'm with. They don't own me. We're in partnership we are serving one another in in a multitude of ways emotionally mentally like serving one another in a multitude of ways growing together when that growth is done if it is ever done and if the growth is done and the relationship no longer serves either party it is okay to choose yourself absolutely and, walk away. and what i found in doing that is that sometimes another person's energy can block your blessings Truly, because you're investing, and not because anything malicious is going on necessarily, but because you're investing so much time in trying to make something work that is not destined to, like you're just investing and you're investing and you're investing. That's what I was doing, just investing, investing, investing in something that was never destined to work. At the same time that I was trying to grow, it was blocking me from stepping into active growth. It is not um, a surprise that my life fully bloomed after that relationship in a multitude of ways because I, I could not invest that energy in myself. And it's okay to say, I choose me and it doesn't have to be acrimonious. It doesn't have to be like, I never talked to this person again, but it can be, I, the, the, the most important relationship I have in the world is the relationship with myself and I choose me. Yeah. And you know, the part of it that like is, is, it's just that we are, it's hard to say out loud, is that it's sometimes rooted in self-image, you know, um, that not choosing me. And so I ain't gonna lie, like a few, you know, a few years back, I was like, I can't do no better than, you know, where I am because of how I look. Like, I really said that to myself, right? And so it's important that people hear that said out loud so that they can recognize it. This is why I wanted to evoke that within you today. Um, you, I, I need to talk about the S, this essay though, and <laughs> you know the one, you know the one. Okay, um, and I need to talk about this essay because I don't. I think that it's something. Okay, 
I know the real names, so I don't want to conflate them with, I just want to make sure. So what I will say is, you you have an essay where you talk about dating a gentleman who is a plus-size man. Oh, yeah. um, absolutely. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, you talk about how you realize, like, this, we were just talking about some of that internal like that internalized stuff comes out onto other, proje it's projected onto your experience in a union or projected onto someone else um, who's navigating essentially the same experience as you, which is wild, right? Um, and so I got to ask, right? I don't want to give it away if folks haven't read the book yet. This is the essay, right? Like, you know, it's, 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 a, I think it is a very powerful essay because rarely do authors who are writing this work, work like this, take a look at themselves where, it's very clear they were in the wrong. Mm -hmm. And then they take complete ownership and break down why they did what they did and how they've evolved and grown from it. And I think that like, it's so powerful whenever I see that in the book about, I know this is, you know, an essay on the resilience of your body, but I also feel like that essay, you could have said, you know what, we'll go with something else. I think that is very courageous of you to have put that. So I say that to say, in reading that, I had to ask if you could say something to Elijah today, what would it be? Oh, God. And I've been asked that question, Erica. Um, I would apologize to him deeply. I would deeply apologize to him. I, at 33, am not who I was at 22. And he did not need to do collateral damage in my attempted love. And he deserved better from me than what I was able to give him at that age. I, I would just I would deeply apologize to him. Um I would also if I were able to have a conversation with him. I would thank him for being so graceful with me. He was such a graceful partner and such a kind partner. He was instrumental. And I, there wasn't space in the essay to really delve into that. Um, but he was so instrumental in teaching me what a good partner could look like. And so, I mean, it, of course, like it went left. We're not together for, for a reason. I can end up going left. But... Um, he was so instrumental in teaching me what good partnership looked like. I would just thank him and apologize to him, um, and and ask him to for his forgiveness. And whether or not he would be willing to give it is up to him. But to say forgive me, forgive me for not standing up for our relationship. Forgive me for not having the language to fight for us like forgive me Ooh. for not having the language to fight for us that's 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 beautiful and what better way than like putting that language in the core of your life's work like i thought i thought that was very brave and powerful um i'm i'm not gonna lie i read this and i was on the edge of my seat and like uh my partner said you know, like, why you in? You been in the office all day. Like, this was two days ago. Two days ago, I was in the office, and like, I didn't come out at all. And like, literally, every time he woke, he's like, "Nah, it can't. It's the book. Like, it just got you." I was like, I was on my, on the edge of my seat, in the middle of every one of these essays. Even though this is my friend, and that should tell you everything you need to know about waitlist, right? Because I think that it is. This book is very much um, a compilation of things that. And that probably has not had conversations with even folks that she's close with about, but mm -hmm. was brave to give it to the world so that we can see ourselves, right? And the way in which, you know, we are resilient despite, 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 right? And so um, I, my last question is going to be, what essay, because I got a lot, so I didn't want to choose. But what essay are you most excited for folks to read and why? Oh, that's an excellent question. Most excited. I, I would, so I, I often say the goal of this book is, I 
the, the tone of the book is intentionally joyful mm-hmm. and hopeful and optimistic because I do believe a better world is possible. I really, really do. And it, it requires all of us to invest in, in the possibility of a better world. And if that is the case, then the essay I'm most excited for people to read is the final one where I'm talking about like what a liberated future could look like. Um, a liberated future from fat phobia, from treating bodies as deviant, like what that could look like. That's what I'm most excited for people to read because sometimes we just need the imagination. Like it's not something we can see immediately in front of us in this moment, but it's possible, it's doable. It's something that could happen. And if that is the case, um, that that essay is it. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, All right, I'm gonna say, I'm only gonna say it one time, then don't say I didn't tell you. Grab playlist right now, immediately. I do. My mama, do. Just, my mama just walked through the door. I just heard her come through, and I'm about to walk out and hand her a bunch. Like, um, I, I wanted to leave a, a, a little bit of room just in case there were any questions from our audience in the chat. Anybody want to ask any questions for you, Yvette? And then I'm going to right after bring ER up. Um, and he's going to tell y'all how you can cop with this immediately. Yeah, yeah. Please ask questions. I promise we don't bite. Yes. <laughs> Erica, you asked me, um, we'll be waiting for, for possible questions. You asked me um, the chapter in the book You, I most think people should read. What do you think your chapter is that you think people should delve into? Oh, my God. Um, for me... I think it's the chat. I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact title. It was the one. Oh, there, I know. I want to love like Khadijah James. I knew it was about Khadijah James. And this is the the essay where you talk about um, Ugly Betty and Khadijah James and right and just all the pop culture influences. And I feel like for me, the reason it most resonated was because, as somebody who is immersed in pop culture all the time, I don't think I ever think back to the ways in which my possibility models have molded, you know, like Mm -hmm. how I see myself, right? And so I used to watch Last Holiday on repeat. Like, I used to- Oh, I love Last Holiday. I watched it last week. (laughs) But I used to watch Just Right on repeat. Like, and you know, I I think it's just hitting me. As I read that, I was like, oh my God. Like, these were my possibility models. And the reason why I like step outside every day in my five foot 11, 285 pound frame with no fear is because Khadija said I could, yeah. you know, like, and I never realized that. And so, yeah, I, I, that's, that is my favorite essay in the book. And that's why it resonated with me because I'm very much, you know, a pop culture aficionado. And um, I was like, nope, I lied. If that just showed me that I haven't even realized the way in which these things have taken effect on me. So uh, we do have a question and it says, can you tell us about the books that influenced you in writing this book? Oh yeah. I'm, so I, I'll say I'm, I'm really, really grateful to be an inheritor of what I call um, the, the fat memoir, fat essay collection tradition. Um, and the ways in which those authors held the door open for me is what I hope that waitlist does in terms of publishing sees a book that we hope, knock on wood, is a successful book, that it holds the door open for other similar stories to be told uh, from other people's perspectives. But in terms of writing this book, um, I was really highly influenced by the Fat Studies Reader. It came out in the early 2000s. It's like an anthology of voices about the experience of being fat. Um, all of Jess Baker's work, so Land Whale, Things They Don't Tell Fat Girls, all of that has, has been highly influential for me. Um, Virgie Tovar's book, Lindy West, Roxane Gay. I mean, you can run the gamut of fat writers who, before I was even thinking about writing a book, like helped me think differently about myself and about my body and understanding that what I was encountering wasn't like an isolated incident on an island by myself, but something that, um, like a part of a system a system that's working as intended. So so all of those books 
all of those authors, all of those books were highly influential for me. Um, oh, and I just thought of a, a, a question as well, because it, it, it's so interesting. My mother actually asked me this. What are what part of this work do you feel like you wrote for your nieces? Mm -hmm. Ooh, great question. My nieces are too young to read this book right now. Absolutely. They mm -hmm. are uh, 10 and 12. So they're, they're out. Lifting as we climb was perfect for them. This is not for them at all. Um, but I hope that when they're old enough to read it and in, in a place to read it, like they're, they're coming to an age where self image is really important. And I would really want them to take from this, like the importance of being, like having self resilience and crafting an image of yourself beyond what people tell you that you can be or what you can do that really allows you to create a life of purpose for yourself and so much of that is threaded throughout the book but that's what i hope they take from it that you never have to settle for what other people say is possible for you like you can always create a world in which you thrive that's possible okay now i want them to find this recording like eight years from now <laughs> Um, you need 25 years from now, please. Stop it. <laughs> no, you know what? I'm gonna agree with you. Um, in this day and age, and then Derek asks, "Is that were there moments when writing this book was overwhelming? And if so, how did you manage those difficult moments?" Oh, Derek. I know Derek. Hi, Derek. Derek and I went to grad school together. Hi, Derek. So glad that you are here. Um, were there moments when writing this book was overwhelming? Absolutely. Absolutely. When I was putting the book together, I say that the personal stories are the heart of the book. Like they, they are the things that, that bring this book together, but they were all over the place. They were all over the place. There were some places I weren't, I wasn't diving deep enough. There were some places where um, I was going too deep and it didn't make sense in the context of the collection. And so I had to figure out how to make this make sense for a book because a book needs to have an arc and and i mean so many different things it needed to make sense for the context of the book and i managed those difficult moments honestly by stepping away like the working weight having emergency therapy sessions i have many during the kinds of having an emergency therapy session like this book may kill me um stepping away and coming back to it when I could, when I was mentally and emotionally able to. That's what I would do those moments. If I had felt pressured or rushed through this, it would not, it wouldn't, honestly would not have gotten done. So uh, that's true. Um, so once again, I'm going to bring ER back up and he's going to tell y'all how you can cop weightless. Don't say I didn't tell you, I keep reminding y'all today. Yes. <laughs> Was so cute. Um, thank you all so much uh, for this wonderful conversation. Everybody watching at home, all you got to do is click this teal button right at the middle of the screen to buy Waitlist from Karis. It really does help us when you buy your event books from us. Thank you so much. Um, we want to encourage folks to continue to follow Yvette on her tour. So I know you got other events uh, around the country. So where can folks find you on social media if they want to stay up to date with your work? I am free black girl across every social platform, new and old. Awesome. Uh, and Erica, do you want to give a shout out to any of your work on social media? You can just find me at my name, at Erica Buddington, everywhere. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so I will be adding this to our YouTube channel as well. So if there's anybody who you know would love this event and they didn't get to watch it, send it to them from our YouTube channel, which is just at Karis Purple on YouTube, and tell them to buy waitlist. Um, it's a great thing to also request that your public library carry. Um, so you know maybe you can't afford to have it, but it really does help authors when you request um, the book from the library. So get the word out, support um, independent authors. Thank you both so, so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank night. you.